Today we're going to look at Warren Buffett's Ground Rules by Jeremy C. Miller. Words of Wisdom from the Partnership Letters of the World's Greatest Investor. What's in it for you? Warren Buffett's investment advice in his own words. Have you ever thought, you know, life is pretty good except I have all this extra money lying around? Probably not. If there's one thing people have in common, it's that we want to have the maximum amount of money with the minimum amount of effort. And people like Warren Buffett, currently the fourth richest person in the world at the time of writing this book, has made getting rich on the stock market look easy. The general idea certainly seems simple enough. Buy low and sell high. But unsurprisingly, Getting rich off the stock market isn't as easy as it looks. Luckily, Buffett has left us some clues. When he founded Buffett Partnership Limited in 1956, he began writing reports to his partner. He would give insight into his views on the market, predictions for the future, and his investment ethos. Playing the market still isn't easy, but Buffett's wisdom compiled in 14 years' worth of his accessible and humorously written letters is all you need to start a career in the stocks. And who knows, if you're lucky and more importantly consistent, you might even get rich. In the following minutes you'll learn Why buying the Mona Lisa wasn't a good financial decision for France How Warren Buffett did his first arbitrage deal without even knowing it and why patience is the virtue that matters most for every kind of investor. Idea number one. Be patient. Careful investment rather than frenetic speculation is more likely to create value. There's a basic rule Wall Street types don't want us to know. It's a secret that has helped Warren Buffett amass an $88.9 billion fortune. Are you ready for it? The key message here is, be patient. Careful investment, rather than frenetic speculation, is more likely to create value. Investing isn't rocket science, but there's a catch. People frequently confuse speculation for investment, but there's a difference. Speculators obsessively follow unpredictable market fluctuations to buy and sell stocks hoping to get rich quick. Investors, on the other hand, buy businesses based on careful assessment of their inherent value. And then, they wait. The well-known billionaire Warren Buffett is an investor. He attended business school in New York, but he hails from the Midwest, and his methodical, straight-talking approach characterizes his letters and overall investment philosophy. Inspired by his mentor, Ben Graham, Buffett figured that the prices of most financial assets, like stocks, eventually fell in line with their intrinsic values. When buying a stock, you're buying a tiny fraction of a business. Over time, a stock's price changes to reflect how the business is doing. If profits are good, the business's value grows and the share price increases. But if the business loses value, for example, there's a big scandal or something, the share price falls. Sometimes, the stock price doesn't accurately reflect the value of a business. Investors who buy shares in undervalued companies then patiently wait for the market to correct itself. Can't help but make money. The key though is to focus on what the market should do, not when it should do it. If you trust that the market price will eventually reflect the actual value of a business, you can expect to eventually make a profit. This will help you to avoid selling just because the market dips. And this patient rewards you with compound interest, which is the key driver of value over long-term investments. Compound interest is the process of continuously reinvesting gains so that every new cent begins earning its own returns. Einstein himself called compound interest the eighth wonder of the world, remarking that people who understand it, earn it, 
and people who don't understand it pay it. Buffett's favorite story illustrating the power of compound interest involves the French government's purchase of the Mona Lisa. King Francis the One paid the equivalent of twenty thousand U.S. dollars for the painting in fifteen forty. If he had invested the money at a six percent compound interest rate, France would have had one quadrillion dollars by nineteen sixty four. By now, you might be convinced by the power of investing. In the following minutes, you'll learn how to develop your own investment style. We don't buy and sell stocks based upon what other people think the stock market is going to do, but rather upon what we think the company is going to do. End quote. Idea number two: Successful investors all have one thing in common: they compulsively measure. Warren Buffett has always been a supremely confident investor, even when he was relatively inexperienced as a young fund manager. He saw his main competition as the Dow Jones Industrial Average, that is, the famous New York Stock Index. His one job was to grow his fund at a faster rate than the market. It wasn't as easy as it sounded. The key message here is: successful investors all have one thing in common: they compulsively measure. We all know the stress of checking your bank balance after a big weekend or stepping on the scale when trying to lose weight. For a lot of people, the anxiety of failure might be too much to handle. But to be a successful investor in the mold of Warren Buffett, you're going to have to get over those anxieties. Careful measurement, clear-eyed analysis, and a steady hand, even when you're down, are the only ways to succeed as an investor. Okay, time for some more Buffett-style straight talk. The difficult truth is. That most people aren't shrewd enough investors to beat the market. It was huge for Buffett to deliver returns greater than seven percent annually, but the miracle of compound interest means that you only have to do a little better than the market to create the potential for serious financial gains. Knowing what to measure and then doing it properly is the only way to know if you're on the right track. So how do you compulsively measure? You need to monitor your investments every day, keep track of how they're doing relative to past performance, and be patient when your chips are down. It takes energy, commitment, and honesty. In short, you've got to know when to hold 'em and when to fold 'em. You're not just measuring your results against past performance, though. Each year's results should also be measured against the market. This means if the market is down. And you're slightly less down. This still counts as a win. There's good news too. When Buffett was a young investor, doing better than the market was a lot harder than it is now. It's easier today thanks to index funds. Pioneered in 1975, index funds combine slices of many different companies on a given stock exchange. This means their returns broadly match the gains and losses of the overall market. Buffett advises those who don't have the time or energy to devote their investments to buy the index. Otherwise, compulsive measuring is the only way to determine how you're doing. Idea number three: Young investors should focus on buying shares in undervalued companies, which Buffett calls generals. Once you've got the measuring part down, you can start developing your personal investing style. Remember. Each investor is a unique snowflake. Your investing style should reflect your personality, goals, funds, and especially your competence set. So, if you are an alpaca rancher, you shouldn't try to get rich off computer chips. Here's more good news: if you are a new investor with less money, you actually have an advantage over investors managing huge funds. This is because you can invest in small companies not listed on the stock exchange, making big percentage gains. Once you're managing more money, you need much bigger deals to move the needle on your overall results. When Warren Buffett started his fund in 1956, he had just over hundred thousand dollars to play with. 
by 1960, his fund had ballooned to $1.9 million. He attributed this incredible rate of return to his focus on small, relatively unimpressive investments. The key message here is, young investors should focus on buying shares in undervalued companies, which Buffett calls generals. Along with his patient temperament, Buffett's best asset as an investor is his skill at determining the value of a company. In the early years, he favoured buying generals, which he defined as fair businesses at wonderful prices. This means that the companies were of middling quality, but for some reason priced under market value. Once again, Buffett's patience paid off. Most of the generals he bought stayed in his portfolio for years. Buffett also liked buying shares in companies that were worth more than dead, that is, in liquidation, than they were alive. That way, if the business started failing, he could liquidate it and not lose money. This type of business is called a net-net. Ultra-cheap stocks and net-nets are not glamorous. In fact, Buffett referred to them as his cigar butts. But 12 years into his career as an investor, Buffett looked back and determined that this category of investment had done the best in terms of average returns. As his success grew, Buffett's definition of value changed. He began looking beyond cheap stock prices towards the quality of a business and whether its earnings could be sustainable. As his experience as an investor grew, he transitioned from buying fair businesses at wonderful prices to buying wonderful businesses at fair prices. Once you have more experience as an investor, you might want to get involved in the management of one of your investments. Go right ahead, Buffett might say, but you'll need some further guidelines. We'll learn more in the next few minutes. Idea number four. Assuming more risk in markets you know well can yield even more reward potential. As a kid, Warren Buffett would buy a 25-cent six-pack of Coca-Cola from his grandfather's store. He would then sell individual bottles onto his pals for a nickel each. There was certainly a risk involved. If the neighborhood kids weren't thirsty that day, he'd have extra bottles on his hands that he couldn't move. But if he had a good day, he could earn 20% on every six-pack. The key message here is, Assuming more risk in markets you know well can yield even more reward potential. Buffett didn't know it, but with the 25-cent Coca-Cola deal, he'd done his first arbitrage. He was capitalizing on the price difference for one product, his Coca-Cola, in two different markets, the store and the neighborhood kids. Arbitrage is a way to bet on what you think a company will be worth in the near future. Returns on arbitrage bets can be very attractive, but to get it right, you have to know the businesses and their respective markets intimately. When that product is a piece of a company, this is called merger arbitrage. Merger arbitrage were one of Buffett's specialities during his years as an early investor. He would buy stock in a company at one price, betting that it would be worth more once it merged with another company. Returns on merger arbitrages may be enticing, but the risk can be great. That's why arbitrage is usually tricky for the average investor. Unless the deal is in your specialized field and you've studied it inside and out, it's probably best to leave it alone. But experienced investors who don't want to mess with merger arbitrages can also get their control fix with what Buffett aptly referred to as controls. That's when you buy a large enough piece of a company listed on the public stock exchange that you have the right to influence how it's run. As you might imagine, this type of deal can lead to stressful confrontations between company owners and new board members who may demand drastic operational changes. Buffett was vilified for these deals early in his career. He thought he was saving a company by removing the inefficiencies. But as he matured, Buffett stopped getting involved in controls, which could turn out to be messy and uncomfortable with layoffs or firings. 
His core investment principles have never changed though. In the next few minutes, we'll learn why the steady hand approach has been the key to his fabulous investment success. Idea number 5. Your methods may change with the market, but your core principles should stay the same. Following the crowd can be an effective strategy. If everyone's running away from something you can't see, it's probably a good idea to join them. But when it comes to investing, it can be problematic. By definition, the majority can't do better than the average. So to be a successful investor, you have to train yourself to go against the crowd. Warren Buffett's investment style reveals that there's only one instance in which you should put your money on the line. That is, when you totally understand the whole picture and the best course of action. In all the other cases, you should pass, even if everyone else is making money. The key message here is, your methods may change with the market, but your core principles should stay the same. Buffett has always been a cautious investor. When he began his career as a professional investor in 1956, the stock market was generally considered to be too high. But instead of correcting itself, stocks continued to creep up. Buffett not only stayed true to his strategy, but he also doubled down on his ultra-conservative investing approach. He knew a correction was coming, he just didn't know when. Meanwhile, other hotshot investors were making big money. In New York, Jerry Tsai had invented a new kind of investment, which took advantage of the general public's new appetite for speculation. Tsai's approach was the opposite of Buffett's. He'd jump in and out of stocks at the drop of a hat. Tsai's approach worked for a while. He earned fabulous sums for his firm, even as his fund lost and gailed widely with the market swings. But Buffett remained convinced that it wouldn't last. When the market reached a new high in 1966, Buffett finally acted. He announced that he wouldn't be accepting new partners and halved his performance goal. Miraculously, his fund continued to do very well. 1968 was its best year with a 58.8% return. But Buffett knew when to fold his hand. He was done risking his fortune on a market that was bound to crash. Tsai's end was imminent, and he ultimately saw it coming too. He sold his fund at just the right moment in 1968. In the early 1970s, the Dow experienced its most spectacular crash since the Great Depression. Buffett's net worth was unaffected because he had taken all of his money off the market. Tsai barely dodged defeat, but his investors lost 90% of their portfolio assets. Buffett's courage of conviction is a worthy goal for all investors, if not people more generally. Figure out what you believe in, and when the right opportunity comes along, bet big. You almost can't lose. Final Summary The key message in this book is, it's not impossible to make money on the stock market. In fact, anyone can do it. But it's not something that will happen overnight and it won't happen if you don't take it seriously. With Buffett's tips on careful measurement, consistency and most importantly patience, you too can become a successful investor. This is the end. Thank you.